ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming out on a weekday afternoon. And welcome to the 2016 pre-election legal affairs debate between the Commonwealth Attorney General, Senator the Honourable George Brandis, QC, and the Shadow Attorney General, the Honourable Mark Dreyfus, and QC MP. My name's Sean Brennan, and I'm the Director of the Gilman and Tobin Centre of Public Law at the Faculty of Law at UNSW. Our centre is really pleased to bring you this event. There's less than two weeks to go, as everyone knows, until polling day in the 2016 federal election. And uh, by focusing on the respective policies of the coalition parties and the Australian Labor Party, this event allows important issues in the Attorney General's portfolio uh, to be debated and to receive the attention that they deserve during the current election campaign. I begin by acknowledging that we're on Gadigal land. I pay my respects to the traditional owners and also to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I want to thank Senator Brandis and Mr Dreyfus for agreeing to participate in the debate. I'm also grateful that we have a panel of expert questioners here today. From my left, Associate Professor Anna Cody, Director of the Kingsford Legal Centre, uh, a community legal centre operating from the UNSW Law Faculty, and is also a board member of the National Association of Community Legal Centres. Next to Anna is Chris Merritt, the Legal Affairs Editor of The Australian. And thirdly, we have Fiona McLeod, SC, from the Victorian Bar, who is President-elect of the Law Council of Australia. And we also thank Stuart Clark, AM, the Law Council President, uh, who's currently overseas for his support for this event. Can you please join me in thanking the speakers and the panel members? Uh, my thanks to the hard-working staff of both speakers uh, for their cooperation in the run-up to today. And also my gratitude goes uh, to the generous and superbly professional uh, people here at Gilbert and Tobin, the law firm, uh, who agreed to allow use of their premises uh, for the event and who are also helping us uh, to record the event, we hope, subject to a few technical difficulties uh, for later webcast. Uh, our thanks start with the managing partner, Danny Gilbert, AM, a great supporter of our centre uh, since its inception, and they extend to Jenny Davidson, Joe McKenzie, Biff Henry Jones, Alan Flores, Sergio Pesapara, uh, Peter Fricketic, Lachlan Hooker, and their colleagues. And finally, thanks to my colleagues, uh, many of them here today at the Gilbert and Tobin Centre of Public Law, especially our administrator, Linda McDonald at the desk, and Claire Morgan at the UNSW Media Office. This event is being live tweeted uh, by the Centre from its Twitter account, at GT Centre. And for those of you following and or tweeting today, the Twitter hashtag is uh, hashtag AGDebate. Uh, that's all caps, no hyphens, all one word, hash AGDebate. Uh, we're on the tight election campaign schedule this afternoon, so I'll be quick in setting the scene for today. We invited uh, both speakers to participate on the basis of a format very similar to one the centre has used in the past in hosting previous election debates on legal affairs. From the lectern here, uh, there will be an opening statement of five minutes from both Senator Brandis and George, and, and, and Ms, sorry, Senator Brandis and Mr. Dreyfus. Uh, they'll also have a closing statement of three minutes each. In between, the speakers will be seated in the positions they're in now, and uh, we will have three rounds of questions uh, with Anna, Chris, and Fiona each asking one per round, making nine questions in all. Just remembered, I haven't done the coin toss. I'll do that in a moment. Um, each question will be directed to a primary responder, and that speaker will have two minutes to respond. The other speaker will have a one minute reply. The role of primary responder will alternate with each question. To ensure an even allocation of time, both speakers will have two minutes to respond to the ninth final question. The primary responder for the first question will be Senator Brandis. I'm going to do a toy cost, a toy, 
we'll try that again. Uh, we're going to do a coin toss quickly uh, to determine uh, uh, the election of either an opening statement or the final word of the closing statement. Perhaps in the rounds of you would like to call. It's, it's tables. Mr. Drapers, you can elect to Mr. Drapers, you can elect to either make the first opening statement or the last closing statement. Um, we want to ensure strict fairness to the speakers and also get to our agreed duration for the debate. My colleague Shipra Cordia is our timekeeper. She will signal 15 seconds to go with a single ring of the bell. She will signal the time's up for the speaker's response with four rings on the bell. <laughs> uh, for us as a public law centre for First Peoples, and for many others, the contemporary debate about constitutional arrangements and constitutional change regarding Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander peoples is a very important one. Uh, not being the subject of one of the nine questions, prior to today's debate, I invited the Attorney General and the Shadow Attorney General to say something on that topic in their opening and or closing statements. So, time then to get on with the debate. Uh, I'll confirm Uh, we may have a delay on the camera operator, but I think we'll, we need to get underway. I know they're trying to resolve a technical difficulty that just arose um, uh, prior to starting. Um, Chipper, you're ready for timekeeping? Uh, our panel members are ready? Uh, and our speakers are ready? Um, thank you, and then I'll invite Senator Brandis to come to the lectern to give his five-minute opening statement. Well, thank you, Sean. Can I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting for this debate and thank Gilbert and Tobin and the Gilbert and Tobin Centre for Public Law for their hospitality. This election has largely been fought on economic issues, on Malcolm Turnbull's plan for jobs and growth. Issues within the Attorney General's portfolio have not loomed large in the campaign. That reflects the fact that although the past three years has been a busy time in the portfolio, it has been relatively free of controversy. Very few of the bills I introduced into the Parliament were opposed by the Labor Party. The Labor Party's counter-terrorism policy, published today, can only be read as an unqualified adoption the Coalition's national security policy and priorities. Of course, there have been a couple of boutique controversies, but they've been of the kind that gets law school common rooms excited, rather than things that make a difference to the lives of ordinary Australians. Jobs and growth are what this election is all about, and the public knows it. In the past three years, much of the attention in the portfolio has been on national security issues. We've restored to our national security agencies the resources bled from them by the previous government. We've passed four major tranches of legislation to reform the operations of those agencies and to strengthen their powers to keep our community safe. All have been passed by partisan support. And I want to thank Mr Dreyfus for the support he has given the government on those measures. Contrary to the poorly informed claims of some that the bills were rushed through the parliament with insufficient debate, all of them were the subject of long and careful scrutiny by the Parliamentary Intelligence Committee. Almost all of the helpful suggestions of that committee were adopted and the bills were the subject of lengthy Senate debate, including in one case one of the longest committee stage debates in the Senate's history. But although much of the emphasis in the portfolio has been on national security, there have been many other landmark achievements as well. The most important reform of Australian administrative law in a generation, with the consolidation of the various merits review tribunals into a single body, thus 45 years after he proposed it, completing Sir John Kerr's vision of a uniform system of administrative law in Australia. A new five-year national partnership agreement which will provide certainty to the legal assistance sector while maintaining funding in real terms. 
bringing the functions of the Australian Government solicitor within the Attorney General's department, a measure that might sound prosaically bureaucratic, which is very important in strengthening the, stand the standing of that department as the principal source of legal advice to government. The appointment of 26 judges, including two to the High Court, every one of whom was warmly welcomed and applauded by the profession. For the first time since 1996, the restoration of a full complement of full-time members to the Human Rights Commission, while at the same time re-centering the debate on human rights so that, in the words of Edward Santo, the new Human Rights Commissioner, human rights is not the preserve of the left or the right. The investment of significant additional resources to deal with family violence and other reforms to the family law system, and placing the rights of older Australians squarely on the political and law reform agenda. There remains much work to do. Let me conclude my opening remarks by mentioning two issues about which we will hear much discussion in coming months. We must, guided by the Referendum Council, finalise the terms of a proposal to give Indigenous Australians their right and fitting recognition in the Constitution. And we must do so by adopting a proposal that has the greatest chance of success, recognising that every Australian has an equal stake in our Constitution. The constitutional change is always hard, <coughs> and that radical constitutional change is impossible. And we will shortly hold a plebiscite to ensure that the Australian people have their say on the issue of same-sex marriage. As a supporter of gay marriage, I am very optimistic that the yes vote will pass comfortably. When it does, the parliament will respect the wishes of the people. Thanks very much, Sean. And uh, I'd also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And thank Gilbert and Tobin for providing this space uh, for this debate. I stand here as the Shadow Attorney General with a whole range of policies ready for implementation if Labor is given the great honour and responsibility of governing our nation again. They are policies which are founded on fundamental Labor values of fairness, equity, and justice, and uh, it's in this policy area, as across all areas of government, Labor has spent nearly the last three years, our time in opposition, developing a comprehensive range of policies. Uh, before I briefly go to them, I'd mention another aspect of the Attorney General's role that I regard as unique uh, to the Attorney General as a Minister, that's the role as First Law Officer of the Commonwealth, which is the role of always acting as the defender of the integrity of the legal system and the defender of the rule of law. And it's a role that I pledge myself to uphold if I have the honour of being chosen to serve as Attorney General of the Commonwealth again. Uh, on these positive policies, I haven't got time to go through all of the policy, positive policies that we've announced uh, over the last two and a half years. Uh, but I've mentioned a few. The first is, and very importantly, restoring access to justice, which means proper funding to the community legal centres, to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, to the family violence prevention legal services, to legal aid and to the environment defence offices. And I mean proper funding. It uh, is, we've made specific funding commitments in each of these areas. Uh, we would encourage debate about law reform. And what that would mean would be ending the gag clause that's been inserted as a condition of funding for legal assistance areas. Now, unlike the coalition, we actually support a diversity of opinion. We support debate about law reform, and we think that CLCs and ATSOLs and the whole of the legal assistance sector have got a great deal of valuable to say, and we'd encourage it. Now, we have a somewhat bipartisan position with the coalition on taking action to end the scourge of domestic violence in our community and we've announced a range of policies in that area, most notably funding 
uh, giving additional funding to the community legal centres who stand in the front line uh, against domestic violence and protecting victims. The policy announced last Saturday protecting victims of family violence and family court proceedings from being cross-examined by the perpetrator. Uh, and a most important policy, we have pledged to introduce legislation to the Australian Parliament within 100 days of taking office to implement marriage equality in Australia. Uh, not to go down the divisive route of a plebiscite, but to introduce a bill in the proper way that Australian legislative processes should take place. Uh, I'm very proud of these and the other positive policies that we've announced. Um, on Indigenous recognition, uh, of course, uh, we stand with the government in wanting to move forward with the project for Indigenous recognition in the Constitution. Uh, it's a project that's long overdue, but in particular, I'd mention something that's been the subject of some debate uh, over the course of the last week since mentioned by the Leader of the Opposition, Bill Shorten, on Q&A, and that's the question of the treaty. Treaty is a live debate in the Aboriginal community. It's entirely appropriate that that be recognised. It can't be sidestepped, and uh, we stand for the proposition that it's possible to continue to discuss a treaty between Indigenous Australians and other Australians at the same time as progressing the Indigenous recognition project in our constitution. Uh, the two are not inconsistent and in no sense. Uh, we have to recognise that it's there, we have to recognise that it's been raised by the Indigenous community. Uh, we can't sidestep it. I'd say this, that in contrast to Labor's commitments for fairness and equity, the Abbott Turnbull government and my counterpart in, in particular, Senator Brandis, have been a disaster for the rule of law and a disaster for access to justice in this country. I don't agree with Senator Brandis that the area has been free of controversy uh, over the last two years and nine months. How could he say that uh, when there have been repeated attacks on access to justice? Uh, there's been attacks uh, with cuts to funding. Uh, it, it's bizarre for the Attorney General to be suggesting that the National Partnership Agreement has provided certainty to community legal centres at Atsils. They are facing what they describe as a funding cliff on the 1st of July 2017 with a 30% cut. There have been attacks on independent legal voices, and I have in mind the attacks on Professor Triggs, and most recently the attack on the independence of the Solicitor General, and I'll have more to say about that. and the speakers can stay in their seats until the closing statements. Senator Brandis is the primary responder for the first question. We have two minutes to respond and Mr Dreyfus will have a one minute reply. The first question is from Anna Cody and it's about domestic violence and community legal centre funding. Anna. As we all recognise, domestic violence is a serious entrenched issue affecting many women and families in Australia. Community legal centres help thousands of women each year facing this problem. Our funding has been cut by a third from 2017 and in total by 35 million over the next three years. We welcome a commitment to provide 30 million for domestic violence legal services, but it still hasn't been decided how that money will be spent and a piecemeal approach patching on funding for domestic violence prevents legal centres from properly planning their services and intervening early. Is 30 million enough to deal with domestic violence legal needs? Can you commit to supporting community legal centres who provide frontline help to victims with reliable, planned, sufficient funding? Well, thank you very much indeed, Anna. It's a very important question. Um, let me uh, tell you what the position is, what the facts are in relation to funding. I mentioned the National Partnership Agreement. The National Partnership Agreement is a comprehensive agreement that gives the sector certainty over five years and will see funding increase by 6% or $12 million over that five years. The total amount provided uh, to all um, frontline services, in the community, including community legal centres, will be $1.6 billion. As well as that, in September of last year, the Prime Minister announced the Women's Safety Package, 
a $100 million measure, which included $15 million to fund 12 new domestic violence units and four health justice partnerships. That's in addition to funding provided under the um, National Partnership Agreement. And in the budget uh, in May, uh, the government announced the third action plan of the National Plan to Reduce Violence Against Women and Their Children of a further $100 million, of which $30 million is for frontline legal assistance services. So that's an additional $45 million on top of the base uh, funding of $1.6 billion across the sector over the next five years. The allocation of the $1.6 billion as between legal aid commissions and community legal centres uh, is a matter to be determined by state and territory governments. Lastly, you mentioned the funding cliff. What I think you mean is the end of terminating funding on the 30th of June 2017 that was uh, announced in the 2013 budget by Mr Dreyfus. It was Mr Dreyfus who decided that that funding would end after four years, not me. And now a one minute reply from Mr Dreyfus. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, the only certainty that the National Partnership Agreement provides to the legal assistance sector is the certainty that less funding is going to be provided to community legal centres, to Axel's, the family and family violence legal centres, of course, have been consigned off to the Prime Minister's department, uh, something that the Attorney General uh, should have prevented from happening, and their funding is now in a state of complete uncertainty. Uh, it's quite wrong for a government which is saying that it is committed to do more in the context of family violence to be committing, in fact, to reducing the funding that is available for community legal centres for APSELs and for Family Violence Prevention Legal Services, uh, which stand at the front line. Labor has recognised this in our policy announcements in relation to family violence, uh, and we will continue to stand behind the role that is to be played by the legal assistance sector. Uh, thank you. Our next question is from Chris Merritt. Uh, it's to Mr Dreyfus, and it's about Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act. Do you consider the practical impact of Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act to be desirable? I'm referring in particular to the litigation over an attempt to use Section 18C against non-Indigenous university students in Queensland who used social media to ridicule their ejection from a computer room that was reserved for Indigenous students. Do you believe Section 18C needs to be changed to avoid a repeat of this case? Well, I, I think um, Chris, as Legal Affairs Editor of The Australian, perhaps you'd recognise that it, the inappropriateness of me being invited to comment on a case that is currently before the Federal Circuit Court in Brisbane, where a range of allegations and counter-allegations have been made and reported on in your newspaper. Uh, I'm not going to be commenting on that case until it's resolved. Uh, but if it's an invitation to me to comment on the way in which Section 18C has served Australia very well, in the 20 plus years that it's now been in force, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I've regarded as shameful the attacks that were made by this Attorney General on Section 18C, ham fisted though they were, um, and I'm not there making that up. That's uh, actually something that the former Attorney, former Prime Minister, Mr. Abbott, in an article in Quadrant, uh, said he described it as a rather convoluted draft repeal bill uh, put forward by this Attorney General. Uh, and it seems that he's still wanting to go on with it. And that's another shameful thing, that notwithstanding the wave of community opposition with many, many dozens of community groups that stood shoulder to shoulder, and I was proud to stand shoulder to shoulder with them to resist this attempt to remove a law that has served Australia very well and stood as a barrier against racial vilification in our country. It's setting a standard against racial vilification in our country. In contrast to that, uh, I, it, it appears that this Attorney General, Senator Brandis, would like to go on with it. I'd invite him to rule out for the next term of government uh, if the Liberal Party is re-elected to government, uh, rule out any further attempts uh, to repeal this law or change this law uh, because the community spoke and, frankly, it needs to be ruled out because I don't believe uh, the position that was adopted by Mr Abbott as Prime Minister on the 6th of August 
2014 when he said they wouldn't be going on with the hand-fisted attempt. It appears from repeated attempts and repeated statements made by Liberals that they really do want to go on with it. And now one minute reply from Senator Randers. Well, Chris, um, I followed the um, QUT uh, students' case quite closely. Um, like Mark, um, I don't feel that it would be appropriate for me to comment on it. Um, it has certainly raised a lot of eyebrows, uh, but um, uh, we will uh, look very carefully at uh, the way in which uh, the matter is handled by both Professor Triggs and uh, uh, the course of uh, the litigation if that litigation proceeds. In relation to Section 18C, I've got to say to you that I was disappointed at the way in which the debate went in 2014, but in September of that year, uh, the then Prime Minister made a decision to take the issue off the table for reasons that were explained then, that remains the government's position. Thank you. Uh, question three is to Senator Brandis. It's from Fiona Mattel SC, and it's about Indigenous imprisonment. Uh, Senator, the... Just a button. Yeah. Button. Uh, Senator, the Law Council welcomes the bipartisan support of both parties to constitutional recognition. The rate of Indigenous incarceration in Australia is catastrophic, however, and continues to increase unabated. While violent crime and family and community violence are significant contributing factors, Indigenous youth are now around 50 times more likely to be in detention than non-Indigenous youth. Currently, there is no national strategy dealing with Indigenous law and justice setting out a plan to address this issue. Will your party commit to developing and implementing a new intergovernmental framework to address imprisonment in consultation with Indigenous communities in your first year of government, if elected? Well, Fiona, thank you for raising that question. It's a question that I know is a very important priority of the Law Council, and it's an issue that I've uh, discussed uh, with Stuart Clark and I want to applaud what the Law Council has done to prioritise the issue. You're right when you call attention to the gravity of this problem. At the moment, <coughs> Indigenous people are 13 times more likely to be in prison. That's across all age ranges, and as you point out, it's worse among young Indigenous people than are non-Indigenous. 27% of the prisoner population is Indigenous. So let me tell you some of the things that the government is doing at the moment. Uh, we've invested $14 million per annum to support 35 Indigenous justice-related programs, including 10 prisoner through care services that support the re-entry of Indigenous uh, prisoners into the community when their sentences have uh, finished, 8 diversion activities, 15 prevention activities, and 2 com community-based mediation activities. This is, as you know, an issue that is primarily an issue that arises, the coalface of which it arises is primar primarily the state and territory prison system. But nevertheless, Commonwealth does have a leadership role and in funding the programs that I've mentioned, uh, it will be evident to you that this government accepts and assumes a leadership role. I would like to, were the uh, government to be returned at the election, to continue to work with the Law Council, to work uh, with the state and territory governments to build on those programs. And a one minute reply from Mr Dreyfus. Thank you. Uh, you. You cannot overstate the seriousness of the problem in, of Indigenous incarceration. You've only got to state that a quarter of the prison population is Indigenous to see that. Uh, we've committed to introducing Indigenous justice targets uh, as part of the Closing the Gap program. I would prioritise in Ministerial Council discussions with the states and territories, uh, recognising that it is in part, the incarceration rate is in part produced by state and territory legislation that needs to be worked on. Uh, we've made a proposal for a fines system uh, to use the Australian national taxation system for fine collection so as to reduce the uh, dreadful problem of people going to jail often for lengthy periods because of non-payment of a fine. We pledge to increase funding for ATSOs because, of course, additional representation will assist in keeping Indigenous people out of jail. 
Uh, it's about concrete policies and it's also about money. You don't deal with this problem by cutting half a billion dollars out of Indigenous programs, which is what the Abbott Terminal Government has done. We're into round two of the questions. The next question is to Mr Dreyfus. It's from Anna Cody and it's about family law and proposals to ensure the safety of women and children. As we know, domestic violence plays out in many arenas, including in family law. Rosie Batty and Women's Legal Services Australia have a five-point plan for improving the experience of women in their family law cases to ensure there's a greater focus on safety for victims of violence and their children. Is your party committed to implementing the five-step plan, which includes a focus on a mediation model with specialist domestic violence lawyers, specialist case management at the family court, and protection from cross-examination by the abuser? Thanks, Anna. It's a very good question, and I think I'm happy to say, and I'm sure Senator Brandis will be happy to say, that we've seen a tremendously increased interest and focus on doing something about the dreadful scourge of family violence in our community. Uh, it's in part because Rosie Batty uh, became Australian of the Year. Uh, sadly, as has been noted in the media today, would have been Luke Batty's 14th birthday. It's in part because of excellent work that was done by Quentin Bryce in a report for the Queensland Government reporting in February last year and uh, another excellent piece of work in the Royal Commission presided over by Marcy and Eve in Victoria which uh, reported at the end of March this year. Uh, the Victorian Government has al re already responded to that with a commitment of about half a billion dollars in this year's Victorian state budget. But all of this taken together shows us that we've got a great deal more to do and I've welcomed uh, the announcements that have been made by the Abbott Turnbull Government, uh, the announcements made by Senator Brandis. Uh, we too, since March last year, the very first of our positive policies announced in March last year uh, was a policy to deal in part, because all of this is only in part uh, with family violence. Uh, at the centre of, of that was a commitment to give additional funding to community legal centres. But the other measures that Anna's question referred to uh, of course, in part, revolve around changes in the way in which our family court, federal circuit court, uh, go about their business. Uh, I noted that just today, the heads of the uh, two jurisdictions, um, the Chief Judge of the Federal Circuit Court, John Pascoe, and the Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia, Diana Bryant, have endorsed um, many of the measures set out in Rosie Batty's five-step plan. Uh, if you look closely at the details of the policies we announced last March and further policies announced just on Saturday, you'll see that Labor too uh, is adopting many of the elements of Rosie Batty's five-point plan. One minute reply from Senator Brandis. Well, thank you uh, very much indeed. Um, like Mr Dreyfus, um, I am not going to adopt the five-point plan or announce the adoption of the five-point plan today, but that having been said, um, of it, uh, I have studied it carefully, I've discussed it with practitioners in the field uh, and uh, there are many elements of it that I think uh, are worthy of very careful consideration. Uh, that consideration will be informed not merely by uh, the recommendations of Rosie Batty, they'll also be informed by the Bryce report which I've discussed with Quentin Bryce. Uh, they'll be informed by the uh, report of the Family Law Council on families with complex needs, a reference which I gave the Family Law Council, which reports next Thursday, and they'll be informed by the Australian <coughs> Institute of Family Studies uh, report on the effects of the family law system on children and young people. So there is a variety of sources, there is a variety of views, all of them need to be considered. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Chris Merritt. It's to Senator Brandis, and it's about freedom of religion and same-sex marriage. If same-sex marriage is recognised, there is a real prospect that such a legal change would cause tension with religions that teach that marriage is a sacrament that can only be administered to a couple that consists of a man and a woman. What would you do to ensure that religious organisations and their followers who hold such a view continue to enjoy the freedom to practise their religion, not just in churches, synagogues and mosques, but in their everyday lives. If freedom of religion is a fundamental human right, 
what steps would you put in place to protect that right? Will you ensure that religions that adhere to their teachings are not branded discriminatory and subjected to civil litigation if the law is changed to recognise gay marriage? Well, Chris, um, that's an extremely important issue you raise, and it's an issue, if I may say so, that has been occupying my thoughts a great deal in the last few months. And I speak as a person who is a supporter of gay marriage and a Catholic. So I believe, because I support gay marriage, I think that, that is a very, it is a very important for Australia that where we land in this debate is with that outcome, with Australia recognising gay marriage, but not at the cost of religious freedom. It is not a zero-sum game. It is possible to protect religious freedom and enact gay marriage, as long as one goes about it carefully. In progressing this issue, I've had many, many meetings with people on both the yes and the no side of the argument. And among those on the no side of the argument, I've met the Catholic Church, the Catholic Archbishops, the, the, the Australian Christian Lobby, and others. I think the people, the, the, the leaders of the yes case, understand and accept the protection of the sacrament of marriage or its equivalent, theological equivalent in the various religious faiths should be respected. I think they accept that by promoting the idea of marriage between same-sex couples, they, should, they can and should respect the freedom of religions to practice and administer their own sacraments, to practice their own liturgies, to teach their own religious teachings. So it is possible to go about this in a way that respects both of those important values. And the legislation that I have to introduce to legalise same-sex marriage will do so. Uh, one minute reply from Mr Dreyfus. Yes, thank you. Let's be clear about Labor's commitment. It's to introduce a bill to the Australian Parliament within 100 days of taking office for marriage equality in this country so that people who love each other can marry each other with completely equal status. At the same time, I want to make it clear that no minister of religion is going to be forced to marry anybody that they don't wish to marry. And there's a whole lot of confusion that has been introduced to this debate. It's in fact quite simple. Regrettably, we have a coalition government that in pre that present is committed to a divisive plebiscite that will waste $160 million of taxpayers' money uh, and is something that would be unprecedented in legislative history in Australia because we have never changed the law in Australia through a plebiscite process. It's wrong to be proposing it now. It's a divisive, delaying tactic adopted by Tony Abbott and regrettably continued now by Mr Turnbull. Thank you. Question six is to Mr Dreyfus from Fiona McLeod and it's about federal courts resourcing. The federal courts are fundamental to upholding the rule of law, including resolution of commercial, commercial disputes and the protection of fundamental human rights. Without proper funding, vulnerable children and other family members are not adequately protected from exposure to family violence, <coughs> neglect and abuse. Current under-resourcing of the courts means that families facing the most serious family law issues can wait for as many as three years before a final trial. Will your party commit to a comprehensive review of federal courts funding arrangements by an appropriate body such as the Productivity Commission? Uh, we've noted uh, re that repeatedly over the last uh, three years, over this term of government, the heads of the jurisdictions, uh, Chief Judge of the Federal Circuit Court and the Chief Justice of the Family Court of Australia, Diana Bryant, have both called for additional funding for their courts uh, less so from the other two federal courts, the Federal Court and the High Court of Australia. The particular pressure is, of course, on the Federal Circuit Court, which is hearing upwards of 100,000 cases a year and is the workhorse court of the federal jurisdiction. Uh, I noted that just today, in a joint statement, which I've referred to already, made by John Pascoe and by uh, Justice Diana Bryant, um, they have reminded Australians of Justice Diana Bryant's previous call for $17 million uh, to fund the courts for family violence 
initiatives. Uh, they're announcing some commitment to uh, reorder the business of the courts in order to cope with um, family violence. Uh, of course, Labor in government would look very closely at the funding needs of the federal courts, of all four the federal courts, but particularly the Family Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit Court. Now, uh, we would also ensure that there are appointments made to these courts. And I mention here uh, two matters. Uh, the first is that, um, extraordinarily, uh, Senator Brandis has left vacant, often for many months, fully funded judicial positions on the Family Court of Australia and the Federal Circuit Court. And it's an inexplicable thing to do because it actually doesn't even have a fiscal consequence. It's simply adding to delay. Uh, we've made, as an election commitment, a promise to appoint three additional judges to the Federal Circuit Court and an additional judge uh, to the uh, Family Court of Australia in jurisdictions where there is particular delays being Parramatta, Wollongong and Brisbane. One minute reply from Senator Brandis. Well, thank you. Um, Mark, you say the needs are less so with the other two federal courts, oh, the Federal Court of Australia and the High Court. In fact, neither of those courts has come to the government to ask for additional funding. So, uh, that's a, with respect, that's an overstatement. Um, in relation to the family courts, in the 2015-16 budget, the government invested an additional $22.5 million to address the very need of which you speak. Of course, the administration of courts is ultimately a matter for the head of jurisdiction, uh, for the registrar and for the CEO. Uh, but nevertheless, um, we always, as any government does, as you would have done when you were the Attorney General, are mindful of the needs of the courts. In relation to alleged delays, the Family Court of Australia is fully constituted. Uh, of the 65 judges of the Federal Circuit Court, uh, there are 64 in place. There were 65 until yesterday when Judge Roberts retired. Thank you. And our next question in the final round of three is to Senator Brandis. It's again from Anna Cody and it's about limits on community legal centres engaging in law reform and policy work. Community legal centres work with disadvantaged clients and communities. We see the law and how it fails to protect and help our clients with housing, debt, work or domestic violence issues. Because of our close connection to our communities, we can develop innovative and effective ways of solving recurring legal problems through suggesting changes to the law and the legal system. Do you think that community legal centres should be funded to do law reform work as well as their individual client work? As recognised in the Productivity Commission's report, isn't this a cost-effective preventive strategy for legal problems? Well, Anna, I don't agree, uh, uh, because it's about priorities. It would be good if there were more money available for the system. In any department of government, it would be great if there were more money. But because, as we all know, there are limits on the resources, we have to prioritise. And I um, completely uh, um, make no apology for saying that we should put the needs of individual clients before causes. Now, it is not right to say, as has been asserted, that there is a prohibition on legal centres engaging in advocacy. What we have said is that the Commonwealth's contribution to community legal centres is to be prioritised so that it is all spent on clients. If the lawyers who work in community legal centres want to engage in advocacy, want to engage in, uh, in political work uh, on, uh, on their own behalves or even in the name of those community legal centres, and that's entirely a matter for them. But in an, a, an area where there are constrained resources, where there are individual flesh and blood people with particular needs, and there isn't enough money in the system to look after them, I think it is socially just to say you should devote all of the resources on the people who's, who come to your centre, whose needs need to be addressed. And if you want to engage in advocacy, if you want to engage in political work on your own time, at your own expense, that's entirely a matter for you. Uh, one minute reply from Mr Dreyfus. Uh, the foolishness of Senator Brandis's response is quite striking. The hard-nosed economists of the Productivity Commission 
understood and recommended that everyone in the legal assistance sector should continue to be able to engage in law reform and advocacy. And that's for the simple reason that thousands and thousands of Australians can potentially benefit from often quite simple changes to the law. Senator Brandis wants the legal assistance sector to proceed on a case-by-case -case basis, dealing only with individual clients, and even if uh, they see the need, a pressing need for law reform, they are to remain silent, they are to remain gagged. Well, I reject that approach to legal assistance, I reject that approach to law reform, I reject that approach to community debate. Uh, I want to see a continuation of useful reforms like residential tenancy legislation and consumer credit law, which came out of the Community Legal Centre movement, or the countless recommendations that Axels have made to state, territory and Commonwealth governments to keep Indigenous people out of jail. Thank you. The eighth question is from Chris Merritt. It's to Mr Dreyfus, and it's about federal judicial appointments. Do you believe the current method of selecting federal judges and tribunal members is sufficiently robust to prevent a future government from selecting judges based only on their politics? If you believe the selection process needs to become more independent of government, would you extend the reach of such a system to cover the Road Safety Remuneration Tribunal, if it is not abolished, and the Fair Work Commission? Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, I've long been in favour of a much more open and a much more transparent means of appointing people to all bodies in the federal government, including the federal judiciary and federal tribunals. And what that means is not necessarily going to some more formal system like they have in the United Kingdom with a Judicial Appointments Commission, but rather an open system where there are calls for expressions of interest where people can apply for appointment to federal tribunals and federal courts and federal bodies and uh, following that uh, an appropriate filtering system uh, with, uh, as was the case when I was Attorney General and my two Labor predecessors, Robert McClellan and uh, Nicola Roxon, uh, a committee uh, usually consisting of the head of the jurisdiction uh, of an eminent retired judge or tribunal member from that jurisdiction and most usually a Deputy Secretary of the Attorney General's Department who were in a position to then make recommendations, prioritise recommendations uh, to the government as to who might be suitable for appointment. I think it's a conceit uh, to think that the Federal Attorney General could possibly know all of the available field uh, for any particular appointment. Uh, there are potentially hundreds of people who are eligible for appointment, suitable for appointment. And I think that's the only way we will get to what I regard as a reflective, not representative, but a reflective uh, judiciary and a reflective uh, membership of tribunals. And what I mean by that is that members of the Australian community, when they look at the judiciary, when they look at tribunals, when they look at government boards, should be able to see boards and tribunals and courts which reflect the community of which they are members. One minute reply from Senator Brandis. Well, Chris, the ultimate um, test of whether or not a judicial appointment is an appropriate one is the reputation of the person and the opinion of the profession as the arbiter of that reputation. And that's why I observed in my opening remarks one thing I'm particularly proud of in this term as Attorney General is the universal praise of the appointments that this government has made for the courts, whether it be the High Court, the Federal Court, whatever. Um, you mentioned the politics of the people being appointed. I've appointed, or well, the government on my recommendation has appointed 26 judges. I wouldn't have the faintest idea of the politics of any of them. Any of them. Although I, I was a little surprised when I was swearing in a judge Obdorovic at the Parramatta the other day and she listed Tito as one of her 10 heroes. So uh, that uh, I wouldn't have the faintest idea what their politics was. They were chosen in consultation in every case with the head of jurisdiction, who is best placed to know as to who was the most suitable available person. Thank you. Our ninth and final question is from Fiona McLeod. It's about legal aid funding, and it goes first to Senator Brandis, and just a reminder on this occasion, both he and Mr Dreyfus will have two minutes to respond. Legal aid has been in crisis for many years. At current funding levels, just 8% of the population will qualify. 
In 2014, the Productivity Commission confirmed that underfunding of legal aid has serious social and economic consequences. It recommended an immediate injection of $200 million for civil legal aid alone, while acknowledging that substantially more would be required for criminal law assistance. Will your party commit to implementing the Productivity Commission's recommendation and to address the legal aid funding crisis? Well, Fiona, I'm completely in sympathy with the sentiment behind your question. I only wish we lived in the golden days of John Howard and Peter Costello when there was a budget surplus every year and no public debt and available money to do the good things that we would wish to do. Now, the Productivity Commission recommended, the, recommended that the Commonwealth increase its contribution by $120 million and the states and territories by $80 million. Uh, we haven't committed to that, nor, by the way, does the Labor Party. The Labor Party has spent um, a, a long, more than a year chastising us for not committing to the Productivity Commission recommendation, but when Mr Bowen published their uh, economic statement the other day, it was notable that the Labor Party had not committed like the school kids bonus really, chastise the, the government for not making a commitment that they themselves were not prepared to make. Be that as it may, as I said in answer to Anna, we have to prioritise and husband the, the scarce resources we have within the system, which is why I'm unapologetic about prioritising um, uh, the, the resources the Commonwealth devotes to individual casework. Um, we have, through the National Partnership Agreement, put in place a series of arrangements whereby the real levels of funding are maintained. There will be a $12 million increase over five years. That's a 6% increase over five years But in investment in the sector. This is the Commonwealth contribution. The states also, of course, make a contribution of some $1.6 billion. I wish there was more money, Fiona. I really do. I wish there was more money, but I'm not going to engage in the kind of cheap politics that involves in condemning the government for not funding more and then saying, well, we won't fund any more either, which is, I'm so, sorry to say, what has been the Labor Party's position. And now a two-minute reply from Mr. Graves. Uh, thanks very much. This is a government that can find $160 million for a divisive plebiscite. This is a government that can find $50 billion tax cuts for big business. Uh, but it can't find $200 million to deal with the unmet legal need identified by the Productivity Commission in a really excellent report, uh, which I hope will assist in the continuing argument for more funding for the legal assistance sector. Uh, contrary to what Senator Brandis has just informed this audience, uh, we have directly committed additional funding, and I'll list the numbers, $42.9 million additional funding to community legal centres, $24 million additional funding to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, uh, $4.5 million additional funding for family violence prevention legal services who are in a state of near complete limbo at the moment because they got moved to the Prime Minister's department, uh, additional funding for legal aid commissions which we have not other than uh, as part of the family violence package announced last Saturday in the form of providing legal representation to avoid cross-examination on victims by perpetrators, we haven't put direct numbers on, and that's because additional funding for legal aid commissions uh, at the state and territory level needs to be worked through as a matter of negotiation between the Commonwealth and the states and territories. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is that we've seen from Conservative governments at the state and territory level that they are prepared to cut further cut funding to their own legal aid commissions and for the Commonwealth to walk into a negotiation saying we're putting more money on the table without first getting a commitment from the Barnett government in Western Australia or the Giles government in the Northern Territory or the Hodgman government in Tasmania that they will not further cut when further Commonwealth money is provided, uh, that's an essential to the negotiation. And lastly, the Environment Defenders Officers, they had their entire funding removed by this coalition government. Uh, we have pledged to restore $10.8 million in funding to the Environment Defenders Officers. So Senator Brandis is wrong to suggest that we have not committed additional funding. We have been very specific, and we are. Thank you. I'll ask Mr Dreyfus to either remove or switch off his lapel mic. Thanks for the final section. Thank you to the panel. Uh, and I'll now invite Senator Brandis to come to the lectern to give his three-minute closing statement. 
Well, I think that the last answer, if I may say, Mark, was very round about why of saying, no, we won't commit to the Productivity Commission's recommendations, which is the point I made in my remarks. I want to thank you again, um, Sean, and the, pa uh, the panellists, and Mark Dreyfus for participating in this exercise. It's not in the glamorous precincts of the National Press Club, and the, the fact that it's not, I think, reflects the point I made in my opening remarks, that uh, this portfolio has been largely uncontroversial, but I'm not saying there haven't been a couple of boutique controversies, but uh, what you have heard Mark say about family violence, about national security and other things, Emmons will, will demonstrate to you that there is largely, though not entirely, a commonality of view. I want to use my time, the next couple of minutes, to reflect upon the fact that in the coming months, this portfolio will be front and centre of two important national debates. The debate about Indigenous recognition and the debate about same-sex marriage. It is, in my view, very important that we get this right. I do not share, speaking for a moment of same-sex marriage, I do not share, in fact, I entirely reject <coughs> the pessimistic view of Mr. Shorten and Mr. Dreyfus that Australia can't conduct a discussion about an important social change without decency and civility and mutual tolerance. I believe we can, I believe we will, and I believe that the outcome of that public discussion will be that the Australian people will choose to adopt same-sex marriage, and if they do, there is not a shadow of a doubt that the parliament will legislate for it and do so swiftly. The Prime Minister repeated as much this morning. In fact, by having a plebiscite on same-sex marriage, we give all members of the Australian community ownership of an important social change. And by giving conservative people who are opposed to the proposition the right to have their say, we enable them to accept a social change about which they are reluctant and sceptical as well. In a democratic society, it is never wrong to allow the people to make a call. When it comes to Indigenous recognition, during the life of the next parliament, it's important we get that right too. So the next period in Australian history will be a period which is very important. It will give us the opportunity for the better angels of our natures to be made manifest, and I believe we will try. Thanks very much. Um, the Attorney General has an unusual position in Cabinet, charged with protecting fairness and openness, the integrity of our legal system. And regrettably, this Attorney General has failed Australia in his nearly three years as Attorney General of the Commonwealth. I'm hoping that upon Labor taking government on the 2nd of July, if that uh, is the result of the election, to bring to an end uh, a very dismal period for access to justice and for the rule of law in Australia because uh, these last nearly three years have been marked by attacks on statutory office holders like Professor Gillian Triggs doing nothing more than her statutory duty in drawing attention to human rights problems in Australia. Attacks, as we've learned recently, uh, last Friday on the independence of the Solicitor General, uh, a shameful episode which I hope will get to inquire more into where the Attorney-General seems to have lied to the Parliament about whether or not he consulted with the Solicitor-General before introducing the direction uh, that in future uh, there will be no access by agencies of the Commonwealth to the Solicitor-General other than with the permission of the Attorney-General, something which we will, would reverse if we were to come to office. Uh, Senator Brandis says Attorney-General extraordinarily for the first time in 
40 years as an Attorney General who was censured by the Senate uh, for his malicious attacks on Professor Triggs. Uh, and taken as a whole, we've seen a pattern of behaviour from this government and from this Attorney General of seeking to silence critics, of seeking to suppress debate, of seeking to resist uh, proper participation in law reform. Uh, so much so that the Poor Law Reform Commission didn't even have a reference uh, for several months. Uh, not only has Senator Berenice failed to respond to two excellent reports by the Law Reform Commission on copyright and another one on native title, he couldn't even be bothered giving a reference to the Law Reform Commission for several months. Uh, I think Senator Brandis is delusional in saying that there has been little controversy in this portfolio. There's been an immense amount of controversy in this portfolio, but it appears that Regrettably, Senator Brandis and the Abbott Turnbull government as a whole simply haven't been listening. They weren't listening to the debate in the community that raged over Section 18C. Uh, that's why Senator Brandis even now won't rule out further changes in the next term of government. Uh, they haven't been listening to the storm of protest about the cuts to uh, community legal centres, the cuts to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, and um, well, uh, I, I move to say that uh, Senator Brandis, in saying he doesn't pay attention to the politics of those he has appointed, uh, he might perhaps have noticed the gender of those he's appointed because Chris Merritt's colleague, Nicola Berkovic, was moved to say in the middle of last year that Senator Brandis had appointed to the judiciary more men who had attended his Oxford College than he had appointed women. Uh, I'll leave you on that thought. Uh, we can do a great deal better in legal affairs in this country, uh, but we can do so by electing Labor. Thank you. Well, that's it for the 2016 pre-election legal affairs debate. Uh, please join me again in thanking Senator Brandis and Mr. Brofus and our panel for their presence and participation today. to negotiate some technical difficulties and that a recording of this event, audio and I hope video, will be available from uh, very soon from the website of the Gildan Tobin Centre of Public Law, uh, gtcentre.unsw.edu.au. Details from Twitter, uh, Facebook and our centre website. Thanks again to Gilbert and Tobin uh, for the use of uh, the room and these facilities and for their splendid support. To Andrew Lynch and to many others here for their indefatigable live tweeting of today's event to Ship Recordia for her timekeeping, and to everyone who helped stage the debate. And finally, thanks to all of you who came today uh, for your interest in these important legal issues affecting Australian society and people and our legal system. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I wish you a good evening. Thank you.